Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm going to do the announcements we, as we get... You can't hear me? Peter said it was on. You can't hear me because everyone was still talking. Hey, hey. Okay. Can you hear me okay? with Buck. He was supposed to be somewhere else preaching, and he's been sick all week, so keep him in prayer. Uh, September 25th, John Fetty will be bringing the message to us, so be in prayer for him. Uh, Please be in prayer for Ian. Like I said, this morning, he's going to bring us uh, God's Word. Then John and Paul and Vanessa Cherry, as they will be leading services over the next couple of weeks. So, uh, please be in prayer for John and Jelaine as John speaks in Blunt today. That's why they weren't here. September 11th, and Paul and Vanessa will have services on October 2nd. Um, I think that's it. Oh, we got some strangers back with us today. Bob and Debbie, good to have you guys with us today. Good to see you. Bob's hiding up here. So... Good to have you with us today. With that, we'll do our opening song.
there is no one like a God. Greater things have yet to come, greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come. for this day, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity we have to come into your house, Father, and worship you, Father, the God, not only of our city, but the Father, the our, our universe that's in it. Father, we ask that you worship and not do the word in word. Out of this city, you're the you're the God of everybody. But what I'm going to do. Amen.
turn it on. Do I need to turn it on? It's on. Yes. Never have been good at these things, as you probably well remember. Just a little bit about what's happened since we've left. We've had a lot going on, and it's been missions, and we just love the Lord, and we just want to be used wherever we can be used by Him. And when you have that as your prayer, uh, sometimes it's even more than you think. I thought retirement, we could kick our shoes off, put our feet up, buy all this, but you know what? It is true what they say. You work harder in retirement than you ever did working, and then you wonder how did you manage to work. So there you go. Uh, I have to share a blessing this past year. You know I run for the sun. You know how we do that for Christian motorcyclists. I have had a go for about the last 10 years and finally made the go. This year I was able to sell enough angels to send $5,000 to run for the sun for the sale of my angels. I finally made my 5000 go. God finally made my 5000 go. He put people in my path. In fact, working on this year already, got ready to leave. I'm trying to pack. I've got all these things I'm doing had somebody call and wanted 40 angels in Texas that I've never even heard of. So here I am trying to get packed to leave, and I'm trying to pack 40 angels to get in the mail to do that before we leave. So anyway, I was able to do that. So that's 200 more dollars towards Run for the Sun. So I'm so excited. Um, Run for the Sun goes to Missionary Ventures, for those that might not know or remember. It also goes to Jesus Film Opening door, Open Doors for Persecuted Christians. The missionary ventures, we use, they use the money to buy transportation for those in areas that, pastors that don't have transportation so that they can get the word out in all the remote villages. Uh, Jesus film, they take the Jesus film into villages and they show the Jesus film and many are coming to know Christ that way. And then open doors, 40% goes, um, open doors, 20% goes there. And through open doors, they get Bibles into persecuted Christians and do a lot of things to share Jesus with those that need to be shared. And then 40% goes for tracks and rag tracks and things that we use in the Ministry of Christian Motorcyclists Association to share the good news with bikers. So that's still going strong. Unlike here, you can pretty much ride your motorcycle all year round. Here, you know, it goes into the garage for a few months out of the year. <laughs> but there you can ride all year round, so we're very involved in that. Um, been very busy this year with wind sweat and the things that we do. We've got a van load full of things, and we're going to pack up some bags to get out them. And this year we're going to do something a little different. We are going to have Christmas in September. They're going to get their bags when we go out there. We're going to pack them up, give them to them. And then if they get a chance to get off the reservation since it's been so iffy and they get to come, then I think Missouri River Riders is going to try to do little bags of candy or something to give to them then. But they're going to have a majority of it in September because they're going to get it on Monday when we go. So that's real exciting. And we'll be so glad to get the weight out of the car. We've already took a lot of material and fabrics and two sewing machines and out of Lakota Chapel to be used in the ministry at Lakota Chapel. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm writing this down. One of our large fields of ministry is our neighborhood. I mean, we've already helped someone that tried to commit suicide in our neighborhood. Neighbor. We've already been there through her and watched her grow in Jesus, come to a faith in Jesus, and she is on track now, and it's just been wonderful. Um, I remember being at the parsonage, and Halloween night, we had maybe two or three, four, maybe five, and it was always usually church members come by the door. We would have so much candy that we would have to eat for the next five months because we bought all this candy. Well, now we're in a neighborhood where they cut the, the only interest in and out. They close it up. And so all these kids from the community come. Last year, we had over 600 children come through, and their parents are with them. So I have got it now. I found a good deal on candy at Sam's. I didn't even have that in the East. So I've got like four ba big bags. And so I've got enough candy for about 1,500 kids this year. So we're going to see what happens. I also have buttons that say, Jesus loves you, or shine, let the light of Jesus shine. And it's got like a pumpkin and Christian buttons that the children are going to get. <clears throat> we're going to get a case of Bibles when we go to the to the rally in Arkansas before Halloween, and we're going to we pass it out to the ones because the families come. It's not just the children; the parents are there, and we get to minister to the parents and we give biker Bibles and we share Christ with them in that way. Uh, we're still hoping to get back on the mission field uh, in England. We're still hoping to go and do discipleship training. You know, we that was our whole intent when we felt it was time to move on, and then COVID happened. And our whole world, as yours, has been shook. 
But you know what? God's still in control. He's still on his throne, and he's going to do some mighty things there. Um, another thing that we're doing right now, Bob plays in a community band. He has his trumpet, and every week I hear him say, Debbie, please bring your clarinet and come and join us. But I'm so busy. I keep thinking, how can I fit in another thing? This Debbie, and I know you're going to find it hard to believe, I am learning to say no. I, I've, I have had a lot going on, and I am finally trying to say no to some things, and especially to Bob when he tries to get me into yet something else. So he's been a lot of the blunt to my no. Um, we are over the senior in charge of the senior adults at our church, and we had a sweet time. We don't, yeah. He says we don't like old people and kids, but we really do, don't we? One thing we got to do before I go there that was just a blessing to our heart was, you know, being retired, you're a little bit more flexible. So when Amy ended up graduating from um, from camp, boot camp for the Marines, we were able to go to South Carolina and be there. And that precious Rachel, she didn't know we were coming. And you should have seen the fa- her face when she saw that we were there. It was so precious. I will never, ever forget it. It was so sweet. And then uh, lastly... Um, with the senior adults, we went on a mission trip. Well, it was a trip for seniors. And we went to a place called Lake Yale, which was about an hour and a half from where we live. And Jenny was one of the ones that got to go on the trip. And she, she braved it out. She put up with us for three days and two nights. And she came back the better, maybe. And so with that, we got to really know her. And she's just going to share briefly just a few words. She is going to leave on another mission trip as soon as she gets home. But she really has a heart for missions. And she said, you think I could maybe go with you? And I said, yeah, sure. Come on, let's go. And so here she is. Hello, you guys. Thank you for letting me in your church. It's lovely. It's a beautiful church. You people are so friendly. Um, yes, I've asked Debbie. I've, I've had some ears open when I first met them in our church. And my ears lit up when they said Native American reservations. And I go, what? So my ears just went like this, like that. And I said, Debbie, tell me more about what you do over there. And she told me. And I says, is there any way I can go with you? Well, let me think. I says, please, Debbie, please, Debbie. She says, okay, okay. So I am so glad I'm learning all about you and learning what you guys do and stuff. Because that's my mission. I love to go on missions to learn about people. And the next one I'm going to is this Saturday. Um, yet from yesterday, I go to this coming Saturday to Africa. And it'll be my f- fifth time going there. And the people there are my family, too. And we fly into Ebony. And then we go into a little village that's called um, Pelicia. And then we go into other tiny tribal villages, and we have clinics. We do their eyes. We give them medication for malaria. We treat them for other skin things and for female things and stuff. And then we do a little Bible uh, translation with the cube. Have you ever heard of the cube that tells the story of Jesus? And it's interesting. They love it because it's a picture. And it shows what Jesus done and how he's on the cross and then how he saves you from his blood. Um, and it's amazing how their faces change through the translations of how what Jesus has done for them. And they just like, that can't be real. And I go deeper and my t- team leader says, you can't go deeper because they're only in this phase. And I says, but yes, I can go deeper. I've got to tell them more. But I do sometimes. But that's what I do. I go out and I try to tell people more about Jesus. And um, that's what I'm going to try and do with Debbie and Bobby. <laughs> Bob, sorry. <laughs> but that's who I am. My name's Jenny.
Okay. This on? Yep, it is. Good. Great. Come on up. Yay. All right. Sarah, come on. Rachel, come on. Come on. Come on, guys. This is so Oh, we got candy. Good. Look, 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 look. This poor girl here. This poor girl. She's so short, you know. But she fell down outside and tore her britches. Ripped her britches. And I think we should take a collection, don't you? I have to look up at her. Wow. I remember when you were this big. <laughs> All right, sit down up there. Good. Uh, I hate your pastor's not here. I hate your pastor is sick. I was looking forward to seeing Buck. And, uh, in fact, uh, during the almost 11 years that I pastored this church, whenever we would have uh, uh, denominational events, uh, some associa associational events, but mostly uh, uh, state events, uh, I would meet Buck, see Buck, and he was always good to us, so I miss seeing him today. I uh, wanted just to say, oh, we've missed you. It's, it's home walking back in here. We are two, separated by over 2,000 miles, but I, you, can trust, you can trust Debbie and I both. There's not a day that goes by that we don't think of you. I mean it. You don't call, you don't write, but we still think of you, okay? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Not, not trying to put you on a guilt trip, okay? Uh, all right. I want to talk about pencils today. All right. We all know pencils. Uh, so the first thing I want to say about a pencil is these are brand new pencils. Uh, can you, can you immediately use this pencil? Can you? You can't do it. Why? Okay. Why? Because it's not sharpened. Because it's not sharpened. Is that right? So to be able to write with this pencil, you know, you, this wouldn't work, would it? No, not at all. So you would have to sharpen the pencil. The first sharpening of the pencil might be, might be like coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Because then we can be used by God. And look, I love this pencil, but I can't use this pencil until this pencil is sharpened. And so when we sharpen the pencil, it would be kind of like coming to the cross and asking Jesus to save our soul. Okay, but you know what? What happens when you write with a pencil a lot? What happens? Okay? It gets what? Dull. That's right. So you have to re-sharpen. And that's why we are in the Word of God. Because we come to faith in Christ and we're sharpened as we go to the cross. And we're used by God. But then... Over time, if we don't read our Bible and we're not on our knees praying and we're not involved in the church and we're not involved in His work and we're not involved in things like this, we kind of get dull, don't we? And so we have to be resharpened. And you think resharpening, if, if a pencil had feelings, it would go, every time it was put in a sharpener, it would go, oh, oh, because it would hurt and it hurts sometimes as we are learning to grow in Jesus. But you know another thing about a pencil? They have an eraser. And in 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 9, it says if we confess our sins before God, He is faithful and just to forgive us or to erase our sins. Isn't that great? So we're sharpened. And then we are resharpened as we go along in our life, our Christian life. But then God erases those daily sins if we remember to ask Him. Okay? First John 1 John 1.9. And then another thing I notice about pencils, they come in all different colors, just like us. And it doesn't matter who you are, what color you is, what color your hair is. It doesn't matter how you dress. It doesn't matter what part of the country or what part of the world you come from. It doesn't make any difference whatsoever because God loves you. 
And, and God loved you before you were put into your mother's womb. God knew you. And then there's another thing. The last thing I want to share with you, because we got to move on this morning in the service, but the last thing, what's the most important part of the pencil? Who knows? What's the most important part? No, the most important part, what's in there? It's the lead. Okay? It's the thing you write with. It's what's on the inside. And that's what I want you to realize. The most important part is what's on the inside, in your heart. You trust Jesus. You love Jesus. You grow in Jesus. He will erase those sins from your life. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, but the most important thing is what's in your heart. And we talked about that in Sunday school today. Love your neighbor as yourself, not judging other people. The most important part is what's inside. Isn't that good? Next time you pick up a pencil, think about it. Here, take a pencil and remember, okay? Remember, there you go. This is good. Oh, you're going to get your own color, huh? All right. There you go. And let's pray. Father, we love you. We love these young people. We thank you for them. And we ask you to bless them. They are all unique. They are all different. Sharpen them in Jesus' service for the rest of their lives. Erase those sins as they call upon you. And then, Father, may they realize the most important thing in the world is what's on the inside of their heart. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Mr. Mark's got something for you. Go get it. This one? Okay. I don't feel right standing behind that. <laughs> yes. It's okay if it's hard to believe I have faith that you'll do greater things It's my time to go, but before I leave Go tell the world about me I was dead Conquered death and I hold the keys. Where I go, you'll go to some. But there's much to do here before you leave.
but until then, go tell the world about me. For I was dead, but now I. Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 37. Very, very familiar story. If you've been in church for any time of your life, you probably heard this story. And Renee Daigle made a song about this this passage of scripture that went really, really well, became very, very popular. Great song. I want to thank y'all for your hospitality for having me today and just uh, having the opportunity to be able to stand up here and proclaim God's word to you and that opportunity to get a last night. I'm going to tell you something. You got the best choir I've ever seen where in the country in high school. So he is uh, he is definitely the real deal and uh, absolutely amazing. So beginning in verse 1 of chapter 37, it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me. And he brought me into the, he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them. And behold, there were uh, very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, Oh, Lord, you know. And he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and, I sh- and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied. It was a sound, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Son of man, prophesy, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet in exceedingly great army. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for thank you for your word. Father, I now Father from here so your word can be heard, Father the blindness from my eyes so your word can be seen. And Father, that you open Father God, I pray that you come into my body. Father, you think with my mind, speak with my mouth. Father, make my heart your heart. Father, don't let me utter. Father, hide me behind the cross. Father, I'm nothing more than a paper boy. I just pray that you speak through this service. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, when I was growing up, I, I don't know if you can tell I didn't grow up in South Dakota. Um, but I grew up in Florida and we had Bible meetings all the time. I remember up in people coming to our pastor saying, we need to have a revival meeting. We need to have a revival meeting. We'd have three or four years. We need to have a revival meeting so people get saved. And I used to think that that's what revival was, was revival was, was 
a Billy Graham crusade. Realize that you can't revive something that's never been alive. Then I start thinking about today. Today's September 11, 2022. 21 years ago today, you saw the Twin Towers fall. Some 3,000 people died on this day, right? We were attacked on our home soil. And I think about how much we've changed from that day to today. And then you think about the fact that on September 12th, our churches were full. Our churches were full of people. Our churches were full of people for, I don't know, a month, month and a half afterwards. Why? People were scared. People saw something happening. Is it the end of the world? Is this when Christ comes back? What is this? You have, and, and then you had people who have been part of the church, left the church. Guess what? Now they've left the church again. But then you can go even further back than that. You go back to July 4, 1776, where we declared our independence. This country was founded on. You think about our forefathers, what they were doing when they did it. They founded us on biblical principles, right? They they tell us that we have the right to worship whatever God we, we choose. We live in the greatest country on earth because we can worship and worship freely. But you know, as you sit back and you think how far we've turned 180 degrees from where we were founded, right? Who's the church? I believe the church, our churches today are to blame because it hasn't had a backbone. The church is dry. The church is, is scared to stand up for what is right. We're scared to stand up for the dry bones. We've become a valley of dry bones in this country, but you know what the good news is? These dry bones can live again. And if they're going to live again, these dry bones have to realize, and they have to realize that they're dry. Look in verses 1 and 2 with me again. It says, The hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. But then in verse 2 it says, And he led me among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. Now think about what that means for a minute. Dry, well, they were lifeless. They were dead. They they had been dead for, for quite some time. That means they've been dead for a very long time. I mean, according to verse 2, right? There was nothing left on those bones. Yeah, I lived in Montana for three and a half years, and, and there was a place called Hell Creek, and we would go fishing over there. And I remember we saw this TV crew, and they were over there, and they were digging up dinosaurs. It was absolutely amazing. I was like, man, they really do exist. And I'm watching them. They're, they're going with paintbrushes. I'm like, what are you doing? Dig the thing up, you know? And the guy's like, no, you know, they're, they're brittle. They'll break. That's what these bones were. They were they were brittle. There was no muscle left. There was no cartilage. There was no there was no ligaments. There was no tendons. There was no in those bones. There was nothing together. They were they were dry bones. They were very dry bones. They were dead. Sound like the church in America today? You see, we don't want to own what we are. The last thing we ever want to do is to shoulder the responsibility of our actions, right? We would rather blame somebody else, blame the circumstances, blame this, blame that. We're, we live in a country society of blame. We play the blame game. You say, no, 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 no. I had this conversation with a gentleman the other day, and he said, no, that's not what it is. It's this. And he turned around and blamed his wife for what had just happened. I'm like, I thought you said you weren't going to blame anybody. You see, we want to use this. And, and this thing right here gets us in almost as much trouble as our tongue does. My tongue gets me in a lot of trouble. You can ask my wife. But our finger, we want to point 
finger at other people. We want to we want to tell our kids. And I think about my dad, my mom and dad. When I was growing up, they they used to tell me at some point you have to take responsibility for your actions. At some point, you have to come to a place that you own what you've done, son. At some point, you have to come to a place that you don't try and pass the buck off to somebody else. And I thought, no, I can keep doing what I'm doing. But you know what? He was right. And I passed that on to my children. And they'll pass it on to their children. And I guarantee you, everybody that's sitting here, if you've had kids, you probably told your kids that. You have to take responsibility for your actions. But then I think about this. What kind of example do we set when we don't take responsibility for our actions and they see us look at God and try and give an excuse? It makes you wonder what the problem is. You see, we make excuses so we don't have to shoulder the responsibility. The last thing we ever want to do is look in the mirror. The last thing we want to do is admit that there may be something wrong with us. The fault may be in me. So we're dry and we're brittle. Not because of others. Not because my mom and dad didn't hug me enough when I was five years old. Not because somebody didn't pad my ego or tell me I was good enough at this or that. The circumstances or, or, or matter of fact, I mean, the, I was born into a family of poverty. That, that's why. That's why I'm like I am. I was, I was born with the color of my skin. That, that's my problem. No, the problem is this. It's my own self. Ty thine own self be true, right? It's my own self. It's my own conscious choices that have got me to where I'm at today. Let's see, if dry bones want to live again, not only do they have to realize they're dry, they have to hear the Word of God. Look in verses 3 and 4 with me. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? I love this right here. And I answered, Oh, Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now I want you to understand something. When he said, I want you to prophesy these bones, that's not him saying tell the future to these bones. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I want you to preach to these bones. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of preachers that preach to a bunch of dry bones today <laughs> in some of our churches. It happens. There's power in the word of God and and the thing is, if we want there to be revival, revival is not a Billy Graham crusade. Revival is the circle that I stand in, the circle that you sit in, the circle that I sit in. It is us as individual. And for revival to take place, we have to hear the Word of God. We need to hear words like Psalms 1, 1, and 2, where it says, Blessed is the man who walks in the counsel of the wicked nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the sea of scoffers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on the law of the Lord he meditates day and night. Or it's like Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is the light of my life, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? Words like Psalm 34 and 19, where it says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Or it's like Romans 8, 31, where it says, But what, must we, but what, but what are we going to do about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Words like John fifteen seven, where it says, uh, If you abide in me and my words in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Words like Acts 1, 8, where it says, But you receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witness in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Words like Galatians 2.20 where it says, for I, am, I, for I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live, I live in the flesh by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. Words like Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. See, that's the one I think we forget. We can do all things. Jesus gives us power. He gives us courage. He gives us everything that we need to move forward with our lives for Him. For Him. You see, the Word gives us something. The Word gives us, it gives us life. It gives us hope. It gives us vitality. It gives us strength. 
And it can only be found in the Word of God. You see, it's the living Word of God. It's not the dead Word of God. It's not just words on the page. It's the only book you could ever read that the words jump off the page and you can see it just like it's a movie in front of you. That's why Scripture tells us heaven and earth shall pass, uh, heaven and earth shall pass away, but the Word of the Lord shall live forever. Forever. You see, if Dry bones want to live again. Not only do they need to realize that they're dry, not only do they need to hear the Word of God, but they also need to respond to the Word of God. Look in verses, uh, look in verses 7 and 8 with me. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound. Behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come up, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. There's power in the word of God, isn't there? God's word, there is power in the word of God. Power, not not a little bit of power. But power, I mean, think about what the power, how much power is in the Word of God. It, it raised the dead. He spoke everything that's in existence into being through His voice. There's power in the Word of God. That's why Paul said in, in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. First to the Jew and then to the Greek or the Gentile. You know what the most frustrating thing for a preacher is? It's frustrating. It's, it's devastating. It's, 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 it's actually discouraging. Is when you, you, you preach the message that you know God laid on your heart. You preach the message that you know it. And, and, and you know that by the time it's said and done, you're exhausted because He was speaking through you. And nobody responds. Nobody responds to the Word. And here you are, you, you leave and, and you go to your office, you go to your prayer closet, you go and, and you sit there and you go, man, I don't even understand, God. This is, this is your message. I know this is the message that you laid on my heart. I know this is what you told me to say. I know that it was you speaking through me. I know there is power in your word. I know these things, God. Yet nobody responded. Man, I'd have got saved if I hadn't been saved. That's, I mean, I'm being serious. And then you see people, and you'll see people out there and they're shaking their head and they're nodding their head and they're going, yeah. And you see people that you know are lost, dying and going to hell and they just walk out of here. They don't care. It's kind of like David Jeremiah told a story of a, it was a, it was a doctor, a lawyer, and a preacher. They went hunting. And while they were hunting, uh, the, the doctor and the, or the preacher and the lawyer shot at a deer at the exact same time and killed the deer. So the preacher said, That's, I killed that deer. And the lawyer says, no, I killed that deer. And they're arguing back and forth. And the doctor comes up and says, look, I'm the doctor. Let me examine the deer. After I'm done examining the deer, I'll come back. I'll let you know which one of y'all killed the deer. And they're like, are you sure? And he's like, I, I got this. I'm a doctor. So he goes over and he examines the deer. He comes back. He says, out in my mind, the preacher shot that deer. Lawyer gets mad, throws his gun down. Who are you to say that it, it, it's, it's the preacher that shot it? What makes you say that? He said, because the bullet went in one ear and out the other. <laughs> you know, we laugh. But there's power in the Word of God. There's power in the Word of God. And I promise you this. His Word will never come back will never come back void. And because of that power that's in the Word of God, he heard something. Look at verse 7. It says that he heard a noise. Could you imagine hearing a noise in the church? Could you imagine if it was actually a noise in the church today where people were actually excited about what Christ was doing in life, what God was doing in that body? Could you imagine what would happen to society today if people were actually I did. There was actually a noise in the church. I mean, it was a rattling. You know what it was? They were reconnecting. What are we supposed to be as a church? 
Aren't we supposed to be the body of Christ? Aren't we? So that means that there's a hand, there's feet, there's 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 arms, there's there's ribs, there's there's back, there's a you know there's all kinds of different parts of the body, right? And I'm gonna tell you something. It's like I told you before. I was actually shooting video of that game night and sending it to my father. And I'm like, look at this. I, I mean, this guy watching what this guy did was unbelievable. To think that here, this guy he's not he's not a college athlete. He's not a professional athlete. But I'm watching a guy throw a ball 70 yards downfield across his body. And anybody who's never thrown a ball, you don't understand how hard that is. Because you're going this way and you're throwing it that way. And I'll never forget, I sent it to my dad. I said, look, he threw it like 68 yards. He said, but he threw it from the other hash. He's right. But when you watch an athlete, I don't care if it's an athlete, if it's a dancer, a ballerina, it doesn't matter. But when they're moving... And they, they, they've, they've trained. And their body's doing what it ought to be doing at that moment. It's a thing of beauty. You see, when you think about these men that went and fought for this country, for us to stand here today, it's not an army of one. Even though the military calls it an army of one today, it's not an army of one. It's a team. You look at the kid that throws the football, Lincoln, I can't say his last name, but Keno. there you go, Keno. Uh You watch what he does. He couldn't do it by himself. It takes a team and other men on the field with him at that time. There's a defense that has to play when he's not playing on offense. Baseball field, you, yeah, you got a guy that pitches, but there's eight guys behind him that have to defend. And then you got nine guys that got to hit a ball. It is a team effort, and it's no different when it comes to what we do in the church. It is a team effort. You sing this song, God of Our City. I like that song. Is he the God of our city? And if he's the God of our city, what are we doing to share what he is for us to the city? They were reconnecting. And why? Why were they reconnecting? Why were they responding? They were responding because there's power in the Word of God. They heard the Word of God and they responded to the Word of God. But you see, dry bones want to live again. Not only do they have to realize they're dry, not only do they have to hear the Word of God, not only do they have to respond to the Word of God, but if dry bones want to live again, they must be filled with the Spirit of God. Look at verses 9 and 10 with me. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, say to them, or say to the breath, thus says the Lord, God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood to their feet, an exceedingly great army. I want you to think about something. Those bones that came to life, those bones that, that stood, those bones that became an exceedingly great army, you realize those are the same bones from verses 1 and 2? The exact same bones. It's the exact same bones from verses 1 and 2. The same bones that were, were, were dry and brittle, were very dry is what it says in verse 2. They're the same bones, but now they have a new spirit. The same Do you think that the church today truly did what God called us to do? Truly did what Christ commanded of us to do? You know, Romans 1 8. Acts 1 8, I'm sorry. Do, do we really think the church would suffer the way it does today? Or would it flourish? It would flourish. You see, there's something in verse 10, the last part of verse 10 where he says that, that they stood on their feet. That's number one. They stood on their feet. The preacher that ordained me, he grew up a sharecropper, and he said the reason we were sharecroppers because we couldn't afford to buy the farm. He said, but there's something I learned. And I said, what's that? 
He said, man, you got to work hard to plant the field. I said, yeah. He said, you got to work hard to, to tend to the garden. I said, yeah. He said, but there's one other thing I learned, boy. And I said, what's that? He said, I learned that you can't harvest the field sitting on the porch. Too many churches want to try and harvest sitting in the comfort of our pew or our chair or our home. We have to be out in the field to harvest the field. You see, so he says that they stood to their feet and they lived. We can't be dead. This, an exceedingly great army. This is not an army of one. It's an army for one. And that's Jesus Christ. So the question, what are you going to do? What are we going to do as a body? What are we going to do as believers? You see, if you're here this morning, you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're dead. You don't have life. You, you can't be revived because you've never lived. But you can come to Jesus Christ and come to life. You can have that newness of life that He gives us that can only be given to us through Jesus Christ. You see, He grants us mercy. He doesn't give us what we do deserve. That's mercy. And He gives us what we don't deserve, which is grace. The grace that only He can give. I can't give it to you. Nobody else can give it to you. I can lead you to the one that can, and that's Jesus Christ. You see, through Christ, that's where you have life. He told Nicodemus, he said, you've got to be born again. In other words, you have to be new. You have to become a new creature. become part of His family. Part of this family. You say, well, how do I do that? We're going to have a time of invitation. And all you have to do, I'm going to be standing right here. That, that's the time where you have to make a decision. If God's dealing with you, you have to decide what you're going to do. Nobody else can decide for you. And there's no guarantee that you're going to have a tomorrow. No guarantee that you're going to make it to the restaurant today after the service. But what I can guarantee you is this. Depending on the decision that you make, your choice was going to determine where you'll be. And where you'll spend eternity. Maybe you're here and you say, Preacher, I, I do know Christ. Are you alive? Have you been revived? Because if you haven't, man, you can be. You say, How do I do that? You lay your burdens down, you get in the Word, and you do what God's called you to do. You follow Him. Everybody stand. We're going to go to the Lord in the Word of Prayer. We'll have a time of invitation. Father God, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to preach your word. Father, I pray right now, Father, anybody that doesn't know your son Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, Father, I pray that they can't walk out of this place without coming to that saving knowledge. Father, I pray that anyone here who, who, who doesn't have the vigor, the life that they ought to have, Father, they've been, they've been dry bones. Father, I pray that you bring them back to Bethel, that place where they first came to Christ. Father, that they have the excitement, the joy that they used to have. And Father, I pray that, that they never lose it again. And I pray that they follow you wherever you lead. Father, I thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen.
thank you guys for being here this morning. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to be able to preach uh, here this morning. It was an honor and a privilege to be able to be here. And if you're a visitor here, please know I'm not the pastor. He's out today. So uh, definitely come back to hear him. He's, he is a really good preacher. And uh, I just want to thank you again for your hospitality. And I, I appreciate you guys, my wife, Tony, and uh, my daughter, Taylor, and uh, boyfriend, Say. So thank you again for, for everything. And I pray that we learn to love him in here so we can tell them out there. So I don't know how you guys usually close it. So if somebody wants to close it out, whoever that may be. Thank you. <laughs>